In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Chart 27 presents the key concept of the division of the books of the New Testament canon. The New Testament division of books has four categories. The Gospels, Church History, the Epistles, and Prophecy. The first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These books are called the Gospels. The word Gospel simply means good news. The Gospels, each written from a different point of view, tell us of the birth, teachings, miracles, life, death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Certain terms found in the book of Matthew indicate that it was written primarily to the Jews. Matthew provides a vivid picture of Jesus as the King Messiah of Israel. Mark presents Christ as a servant. Luke presents him as a man. John presents him as divinity. The genealogies of the Lord in the New Testament are found only in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. The book of Mark does not contain a genealogy, because in that particular day a servant's genealogy was not kept. The book of John does not contain a genealogy, because John presents Jesus as divinity, and it is understood that divinity has no genealogy. The book of Matthew, however, Presenting Jesus as King Messiah has a genealogy because a king must be able to trace his royal line of descent. Luke presented Jesus as a man, and every man has a genealogy. In comparing these genealogies, it becomes evident that the royal line through Mary and the legal line through Joseph converge upon Jesus Christ. The next book in the New Testament is the book of Acts. This book is called the Acts of the Apostles. The first thirteen chapters of the book of Acts show the beginning of the church at Jerusalem, illustrating its early home mission efforts. The next fifteen chapters outline the foreign mission efforts of the early church. The next twenty-one books of the New Testament are the epistles. An epistle is simply a letter of instruction written to a church or an individual. It is important to recognize that these books are written to people who have already heard and obeyed the gospel of salvation. They were not written to unbelievers who have yet to hear the message of salvation. These letters were written for admonition and learning. They were to teach believers and to help them grow and develop into mature Christians. The last book of the New Testament is a book of prophecy. It is called the Book of Revelation. Some call it the Revelation of St. John the Divine, but the first verse of chapter 1 denotes its true title, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. In review, the four divisions of the New Testament are the Gospels, History, Teaching, and Prophecy. Keeping the books in their proper category and perspective is important. Remember to remind your students which dispensation you are in, so that they will begin to understand the plan of God for their life. The general view of the New Testament covers a period of approximately 100 years, from the birth of Christ 
to the date of the book of the Revelation. The New Testament was written by eight authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, and Jude. Please stop the cassette and projection and read Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, the angel of the Lord instructed Joseph to call the name of the male child Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means Jehovah is become our salvation. The next key concept to be introduced is the names of God. The names of God are an important asset in understanding who the man Jesus Christ is. In this study, please understand that we are not trying to make the simple complex. A basic understanding of these names will help you teach the Godhead. In the Old Testament, the term God is often in all capital letters. Sometimes it is written with just a capital G. In the same way, the term Lord appears in all capitals in the Old Testament, as well as with only a capital L. All of these titles, in the original Hebrew language in which the Old Testament was written, portray different attributes. The Hebrews knew that the Old Testament proclaimed only one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In this scripture, two of the manifold names of God are mentioned. The Hebrews understood that God was represented by many manifold names, and that God had revealed himself to them through these names. The basic name of God in the Old Testament is El. All of the names of God that contain the two letters E and L in the Old Testament are translated in our English Bibles as God with a capital G. L means the Mighty One. It is a general term expressing authority, strength, and majesty. L is used over 2,700 times in the Old Testament. The next name of God found in the Old Testament is the name Eloah. To the Hebrews, Eloah meant God to be worshipped. This was the same God they knew, but this name was used when there was a contrast between the true God and false gods. Eloah is the living God. The third name of God found approximately 2,570 times in the Old Testament, is Elohim. In breaking down the name Elohim, note that it contains El. Ohim comes from the term Allah, meaning to make a covenant with another. This name of God, Elohim, conveys the idea of strength with creative and governing powers. Elohim is God as creator, putting his omnipotence into operation in creation. Elohim is a Hebrew masculine term. It is the only plural name of God. However, it is not the plural of God in the sense of gods or persons. Elohim is the pluralism of intensity, majesty, or attributes. It tells of the manifold attributes of the one true God. Elohim is the God of nature and the creator and preserver of all men. The fourth name of God is El Elyon. El Elyon means the Most High God or God the Highest. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. This title of God appears only 36 times in the Old Testament. 
The fifth name of God is El Rohi. This name means God who sees. El Rohi observes all things, both good and bad. Omniscience is one of God's many attributes. The sixth name of God is El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God the Almighty. This name of God appears 48 times in the Old Testament. El Shaddai is God as a source of grace and strength, as giver, not just as creator. This name refers to God's ability to supply all the needs of His creation. This name was especially used by the patriarchs in old times. All of these names of God are translated in our English Bibles as God with a capital G. The next name of God in the Old Testament is Jehovah. Actually, only the initials are known because the Hebrew language had no vowels. These consonants are J-H-V-H -H or Y-H-W-H. Many pronounce it Jehovah, while others pronounce it Yahweh. No one today actually knows how it was pronounced in olden times. For the sake of our study, we will pronounce it Jehovah. The root meaning of the name Jehovah is to be or being. Jehovah is the I am that I am. The name Jehovah is translated in our English Bibles into the word Lord, using all capital letters. All of the compound names of Jehovah that we will study are also translated Lord, with all capital letters. In the Old Testament, the name Jehovah occurs approximately 6,800 times. Jehovah is the self-existing one, the self-sufficient one. I am that I am declares Jehovah's unchangeableness, not only of his own being, but also of the covenant relationship with his chosen people. Jehovah is also the God of revelation and redemption, Jehovah being his covenant memorial name to his chosen people, the Jews. It should be added here that hundreds of years after receiving the Jewish law from God through Moses, the Jews came to regard the Jehovah name of God and its compound names as being too holy to pronounce. Instead, they used the name Adonai, which was spoken when they called upon God. Adonai means headship. It portrays an overlord or owner. Adonai, in our English translation, is written Lord, with just a capital L. The name Adonai occurs about 300 times in the Old Testament. Adonai is the ruler of the earth, the proprietor of all men and all things. The first compound name of Jehovah is Jehovah Jireh, which means... Jehovah will provide. When the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham from slaying his son, Abraham turned and saw a ram caught in the thicket behind him. He then worshipped Jehovah Jireh, because the Lord had provided a substitute in the stead of his son. Thus, one of Jehovah's attributes is that he will always provide for us. The second compound name of Jehovah is Jehovah Tzidkanu, which translates, The Lord, Our Righteousness. This name depicts God's dealings with men under the ideas of their acquittal and justification. Jehovah Kadesh is the third compound name of God. It means, Jehovah that sanctifies. Many things were stressed in Israel's relationship with God, but nothing was stressed more 
than his expectation for his people to be a holy, separate, and peculiar people. Jehovah Shalom means Jehovah our peace. This name of God is used many times in the Old Testament, particularly in the writings of the Psalms. The basic idea underlying the translation of Jehovah Shalom is a harmony in the relationship being established between God and His people. This can be likened to paying a debt or satisfying a demand. Next, there is Jehovah Shama, which means Jehovah is present. This name conveys to Israel the truth that the glory and the presence of God dwelt in their midst. Next, there is Jehovah Rophi, which means Jehovah our shepherd. He is the watchful shepherd overlooking his people throughout their history. He would lead them, care for them, and feed them, as a shepherd does for his flock. Jehovah Kana, the next name of God in the Old Testament, means Jehovah is jealous, righteous, zealous, and passionate. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lord is in all capitals here. There are many names of God represented in the Old Testament that are not given meanings in our English language. All of these names are either translated in the Old Testament as God, capital G only, or Lord, capital L only. They all point to the one true God. The culmination of all these names and attributes in the Old Testament is found in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The name Jesus, from the Greek, means Jehovah is become our salvation. J-E in the name Jesus stands for Jehovah, the S-U-S stands for salvation. God dealt with man in many different ways throughout the Old Testament. He was the voice which spoke to Adam in the cool of the day. He was the written and oral word of God to the prophets. However, when the fullness of time was come, the word of God took on flesh and walked among his own creation. God's name is Jesus. Later, the different beliefs concerning who Jesus Christ is will be discussed. However, in learning about the names of God, it must be understood that you will come across individuals who will try to differentiate personages of God within these different names. What then? In the book of Psalms, chapter 68, verse 4, the scripture tells us, Sing unto God. Here God is translated Elohim. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Yah, which is Jehovah. In the psalm, God, or Elohim's name, is Jehovah. Thus, Elohim is Jehovah. Psalms chapter 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, He is God, which is translated Elohim. The scripture tells us that Jehovah is Elohim, and that Elohim's name is Jehovah. Today there are many good books available, which explain the names of God in greater detail. Basically, it is only important to understand that God has many names in the Old Testament, and that all of these names unveil His different attributes to His people. 
All of this information on the names of God brings us back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This verse translates literally to say, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, our Elohim, is one Jehovah. Jehovah is one. Although there are manifold names of God, there is but one God in the Old Testament. The Hebrew people are monotheistic, believing and trusting in only one true God. They totally understand that these names describe their God's attributes. Later discussions will include why some people in Christian circles try to pluralize God due to these different names. As we follow the study of the names of God, it becomes clear that all of these names culminate in the name Jesus, meaning Jehovah is become our salvation. Jesus is Elohim, the Creator, According to Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Jesus is Eloah, God to be worshipped, according to Luke chapter 19, verse 38. Jesus is El Shaddai, the Almighty, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus fulfills all of the compound names of both El and Jehovah that God took upon himself for Israel's sake. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. As a teacher, it is not necessary for you to expound upon all of these names of God. However, your students should know that they exist, and they should have a very basic understanding of them. You will find that this study is necessary groundwork to be used to stimulate later discussions concerning the Godhead. In other words, the insight gained from the Old Testament names of God will help your students later in understanding the oneness of God. Please stop the cassette and projection and read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. On chart 28, there are two scriptures which tell us of one who would come to herald the coming of King Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the scripture says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Notice that Lord is spelled in all capital letters, meaning Jehovah. It continues, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This scripture is a prophecy of the forerunner of Jesus Christ, one who would prepare a way for the coming of the Messiah. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Notice that the scripture says, Before me, with the Lord himself speaking. It continues, And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. According to the book of Matthew, John the Baptist was the prophesied forerunner of Jesus Christ. Please stop the cassette and projection and read Luke chapters 1 and 2, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. The book of Luke records the story of Elizabeth and Zacharias, the parents of John the Baptist. It records their joy upon the discovery that in their old age they would have a son, and that their son was to be a chosen child who would turn many to Jehovah their God. This narrative also tells us that Elizabeth was the cousin of a virgin named Mary, who was espoused to a man named Joseph. 
according to Jewish custom, espousal is as binding as marriage itself. During her espousal period, Mary was found to be with child. Joseph, after learning of Mary's condition, was very troubled, because he was a righteous man. However, the Lord told Joseph in a dream that the baby which would be born of Mary was of the Holy Ghost. The scripture says that Joseph obeyed the Lord by taking Mary to be his wife, and that he knew her not until after the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus brought the fulfillment of many scriptures from the Old Testament. Fulfilled prophecies is a key concept. From the first messianic promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, it was made known that the Messiah would be born of the seed of a woman. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 adds that he would be born of a virgin. Genesis chapter 22 verse 18 says he would be of the seed of Abraham. Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 says he would be of the tribe of Judah. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 says he would come through the line of Jesse. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 5 says he would be of the household of David. And Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says he would be born in Bethlehem. These and many other prophecies were fulfilled in the beginning of the New Testament at the time of Jesus' birth. When the eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, Jesus was taken to the temple and presented to the priest according to Jewish law. At this time, a very old priest by the name of Simeon a devout and righteous man, saw the Christ child. The Lord had revealed to Simeon that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's anointed. When the Spirit of God came on Simeon, he recognized the baby which he held in his arms. He blessed God for keeping his promise, and said, Lord, now lettest thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He then turned to Joseph and Mary and blessed them. At the same time, Anna, a prophetess who was a woman of great age and had served God night and day with fastings and prayers, came in and gave thanks to the Lord for the redemption he would provide through this child. From the birth of Jesus until the beginning of his public ministry, the scripture tells us little of his life. The scripture picks up with John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John was the last prophet of the Old Testament lineage to speak to Israel before Christ began his ministry. In chapter 3 of the book of Luke, John the Baptist preached a message of repentance as he looked forward to the remission of sins that would be bought by the blood of Jesus. John preached to everyone who came to him, telling them that they should repent or turn from their sins and flee from the wrath to come. He was preparing the way for King Messiah. We recognize today that the very first step anyone must take when they come to God is to repent. There are many scriptures in the Old Testament which tell us God will not hear the prayer of a sinner except it be the prayer of repentance. Psalms chapter 18 verse 41 says they cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. 
Psalms chapter 66 verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Micah chapter 3 verse 4 says, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. God will not hear a sinner unless he first offers to God the prayer of repentance. Repentance involves the taking down of a barrier of sin, which stands between man and God. God is too holy to remove unrepented sin. Only man of his own free will can remove this barrier. He does this by his prayer of repentance. John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan River all those who came to him repenting and confessing their sins. He baptized them with the baptism of repentance. However, John continued his message saying, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The scripture continues, saying that he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather the wheat, and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. With many other words did John exhort the people to repent and to prepare to meet their God. Please stop the cassette and projection and read Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, and John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. Chart 29 shows Jesus going to John's baptism, although he needed no repentance. Jesus was looking forward to the day when he would assume the role of the high priest in typology. He asked John to baptize him to fulfill the righteousness of Jewish law, which said that a priest must wash before ministering. John, not fully understanding, forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus told John, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. John consented, and then baptized Jesus. In the book of John, John the Baptist baptized Jesus, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. In these verses, Jesus fulfills many of the types and shadows of the Old Testament. As he had promised, God gave John a sign that only he saw, the Spirit descending upon Jesus as a dove. This was the sign to John that Jesus was the one who would baptize with the Holy Ghost. After Jesus' baptism, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. There he fasted for forty days and nights, and was tempted by the devil. Note here that in the Scriptures the number forty is a number of preparation. Jesus fasted forty days in preparation for his ministry. In the Old Testament, the twelve spies had spied out the land of Canaan for forty days in their preparation to cross over. The Hebrews spent forty years of probation in the wilderness for preparation to enter into the promised land. Years prior, 
Moses had spent forty years of preparation in Egypt, and then forty years of preparation in the desert to lead the nation of Israel. He later ascended the Mount Sinai for forty days in preparation to receive the law. Jonah, preaching to Nineveh, said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown, thus giving Nineveh forty days to repent. After his fasting and temptations, Jesus' formal ministry began. He preached the same message as did John, but it was greatly broadened. John the Baptist's ministry decreased as Jesus' ministry increased. Because of John the Baptist's bold declaration against the act of Herod's sin of taking his brother's wife to be his own, John was imprisoned and later beheaded. Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is You sing The name of Jesus Christ, my
books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins.